hello everyone i am uh, dr chandrakant mv uh, i am a medical oncologist and i work in narayana hospitals calcutta well in coming uh, 10 15 minutes uh, we will have a very brief understanding as to what this prostate cancer is all about and uh, how do we deal with it uh, should we be really fear or are there, are there any treatments or is it a diagnosis that has a death statement cancer is the end of life or is it uh, uh, something different so well uh, if you look into prostate uh, prostate is a gland that is present in males uh that's present uh, at 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 the urine outflow tract where the urine passes out uh, near the urethra so near that a gland is there and its main function is to add a prostatic juice into the semen that is the main function of prostate gland so very important thing is uh, prostate gland is not required for survival so it is required for uh, production of uh, semen uh but as such it is not required for uh, survival <clears throat> so very importantly uh, the prostate is redundant in the uh, at birth whereas uh, the moment puberty is attained because of hormones namely testosterone it keeps growing so right from puberty around 14 years of age it starts growing and it grows till the last uh, breath so it's the the growth of prostate is basically hormone driven we all know that uh, the male hormones are mainly synthesized in the testes uh, in females the counterpart is ovaries the male predominant hormone is testosterone that causes prostatic growth so that's the reason right from puberty onwards the prostate gland keeps growing uh so we have an organ whose growth is mediated by a hormone called testosterone so as the person gets older around 60s the growth becomes so much that it at times uh uh it becomes so big that it has pressure effects on the urine outflow tract so uh, when when the output of urine is blocked due to prostatic enlargement and this prostatic enlargement can be a part of uh, normal growth of a human being so what we call as benign prostatic hyperplasia so a person can have urinary difficulties like he feels like he has not emptied the urine completely or he feels like uh, going for toilet repeatedly uh, so what we call as hesitancy urgency all these features like the moment he feels urination uh, he cannot control it these sort of symptoms start happening over a, o- over 60 years and uh, this is what we call as the lower urinary tract symptoms or luts so this is because of the overgrowth of a normal prostate because of testosterone so how do we so uh, uh, the moment these symptoms happen uh, 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 it is not cancer actually it can be a, just a physiological or what we call as a benign prostatic enlargement so how do we treat it we treat with simple tablets which uh, reduce the testosterone levels near the prostate or what we call as the 5 alpha reductase inhibitors so like finasteride utesteride just these simple tablets will cause regression in the size of prostate and the person can have reduction or almost resolution of his urinary complaints so an elderly man can have these symptoms of urinary problems basically of urgency uh, precipitancy where he cannot hold back and incomplete evacuation feeling and it's quite bothersome to the patient so this is a uh, very common as far as being prostatic hyperplasia is concerned and the best way we treat it is by uh, using uh, uh, anti testosterone agents where we reduce the level of testosterone at the level of prostate 
so that the prostate doesn't grow more. So the person can have resolution and symptoms. Uh, there is another extreme of it where the prostate keeps growing due to testosterone. It keeps growing so much that it forgets to die or it becomes cancerous. So this uncontrolled proliferation of prostate cells, which is again testosterone mediated, hormone mediated, uh, so it multiplies so fast, so much, uh, that it completely obstructs the urinary, urinary outflow and the patient can no longer pass urine. Not only that, it causes obstruction. Neighboring to that, we have rectum, uh, where it causes pressure symptoms on the rectum and the person cannot pass his stools. So he will have difficulty in urination. He has difficulty in passing stools and the prostate becomes a huge organ and sits there and causes pressure effects. And not only that, it starts spreading. Usually prostate cancer spreads to the spine, the spinal bone or the vertebral column uh, uh, bones. It starts spreading because the blood supply of prostate is so high and it is so and so that the blood vessels from prostate directly go through the vertebral blood vessels, what we call as the Batson's plexus. And these prostate cancer cells start spreading to the bone. And then the patient develops a lot of back pain and that doesn't go at all. So we can have elderly gentlemen above 60, 65 years of age who can have urinary symptoms, not much difficulties, and it can just go away with a simple finasteride or a dutasteride tablet, which is an anti-androgen tablet. And we can have a 65-year-old gentleman with a frank prostate cancer where the prostate gland has become so huge that it is obstructing the urinary outflow and it has already spread to the bone and at times it even goes to the liver and the lung and it can become lethal. So the key is, which are the patients whom we can pick up? Uh, I, I can put a rough estimate, uh, one in two or even one in three, if I put an estimate, can have these symptoms above 65 years. It's a very common symptom. Elderly gentlemen usually comes with these symptoms of lower urinary tract symptoms. Urgency, frequency, difficulty holding, hesitancy. So that's why we speak of uh, 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 using, uh, 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 maintaining difficult, uh, difficulty in holding urine in the elderly and they become children again. So, uh, how to pick up? Uh, not all elderly men with these urinary symptoms have prostate cancer. So how do we pick up these patients who have prostate cancer? So the best way to do is two ways. One is clinical examination. So when, uh, when, a, when a person comes to me with uh, lower urinary tract symptoms, like when, a, when, when the elderly gentleman comes to me with Lower urinary, uh, lower urinary tract symptoms, I examine how the prostate gland feels to me. If it's a hard prostate and it is too large and the mucosa of the prostate doesn't move properly, then it's malignant. So by examining from a doctor, if I can examine the prostate with my hand, what we call as the digital rectal examination. So I cannot touch the prostate directly. I have to go through the rectum and examine. So on feeling, if I feel a hard mass, I can say that this is a malignant prostate. This is not a benign prostate. This is what it what is called as called as uh, digital rectal examination (DRE). And the other best way to understand is PSA, which is a prostate specific antigen. So this PSA normally is around less than two. The moment it becomes more than two, or if it causes four or comes to 10, then my suspicion of prostatic cancer keeps increasing. So to pick up from among all those men who have this lower urinary tract symptoms and who are the ones who have cancer, I have two best methods to detect. Number one is digital rectal examination and number two is prostate specific antigen. So if I get a patient who has a suspicious PSA levels above four 
or if my clinical examination is looking like a prostate cancer, I would like to confirm it because with suspicion, we cannot treat. So how do I confirm prostate cancer? We have non-invasive modalities. Without doing any biopsy, I can do what is known as a multi-parametric MRI and I can look into how the prostate gland looks in an MRI. So there are some specific features with that I can reasonably say whether this is a cancerous prostate or a benign prostate. So the other modality of picking up is a multi-parametric MRI. Well, <clears throat> uh, after this, I have to confirm the diagnosis. And how do I do? How do, how do I confirm diagnosis? I do what is called a biopsy. And uh, we don't cut and open uh, the biopsy. We don't cut. We don't operate. We don't cut. So we do what is called a stress biopsy. We go through the rectum uh, through an ultrasound. And we pick up cores. We, we do what is called a 12 core biopsy from different parts of the prostate. And uh, with this truss guided core biopsy, I can say it is a prostatic cancer or not. So step by step, we need to understand an elderly gentleman about 60, 65 years comes to me with lower urinary tract symptoms. I need to first uh, do uh, a digital rectal examination. And then I need to do the PSA levels and then if not, uh, uh, if it is suspicious, I would like to do a multi-parametric MRI. And if still suspicious, I will do a prostatic biopsy or a truss guided biopsy and prove that it is prostate cancer. Okay, so the biggest risk factor for prostate cancer is age. When the person grows older, the cumulative amount of testosterone stimulating the prostate goes on increasing and uh, the prostate continues to grow in the elderly age. So age becomes the biggest risk factor for prostate cancer. It usually happens in elderly gentlemen. Uh, there are some small uh, subset of patients of around four to five percent or even le or around 10, less than 10 percent where uh, some family history of cancer also plays a role, what we call as the BRCA mutation, but that is not common. So with this uh, in background, if we have diagnosed a prostate cancer by all these modalities uh, of a trust guided biopsy, so we, uh, we have to quantify whether this is a fast multiplying prostate cancer or a slow multiplying prostate cancer. So we basically risk stratify prostate cancer into roughly, we have five groups, but roughly for understanding, we can say three groups because two elderly gentlemen with prostate cancer are entirely different. It's entirely different disease biologies. One guy with prostate cancer can have a PSA as PSA of around four to five throughout his life and a very slowly proliferating prostate cancer. And this person may not require treatment at all. He will die before even the prostate cancer spreads elsewhere. So two elderly gentlemen with prostate cancer are not the same. They're totally different diseases. So now it is not only important that I pick up prostate cancer, but after I pick up prostate cancer, I need to be sure uh, that is this a low risk that is not fastly multiplying or a very slow growing tumor? Or is it a high risk where it's fastly multiplying and spreading soon? So how do I risk stratify it? I risk stratify it depending on the PSA levels. Is the PSA above 10 or 20? Is the Gleason score or the proliferating uh, uh, capacity of the prostate cancer, is it high, which I understand from biopsy? We say three plus three, if Gleason six, I say it's a, a slowly proliferating prostate cancer. I have a Gleason score of six and I have a PSA of around three to four and I have a very small prostate, not bigger at all. Then I say it's a very low risk prostate and this patient does not require treatment. He needs only surveillance. I just keep calling him. I just put him on oral tablets and I keep calling him uh, three monthly and then six monthly and it may be possible that the person has a prostate cancer and the prostate cancer is so slow 
that it may not affect at all. So he, this patient may not require treatment at all. Or in fact, this patient may die of other causes, of heart cardiac conditions or, 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 or any other problems rather than the prostate cancer at all. So the take home message is not all prostate cancers require treatment. There are a small set of prostate cancers where, which, is, which are low risk, which are not multiplying fast, have a low PSA level, can be observed as well. Whereas the other extreme where I have a Gleason of 10 or a Gleason of 9 or 10 where the prostate cancer cells are fastly multiplying on the biopsy and the size is so large that it is going on to the neighboring structures, to the pelvic walls or it, it is going to the rectum and causing symptoms and the PSA is around 40 or 50 or about 20 and these are high risk prostate cancers and they need to be addressed soon. Okay. So now that we have understood that uh, two prostate cancers are not the same, they're entirely different in biology. And one person may require just observation and monitoring or what we call as active surveillance, whereas the other person requires urgent treatment. So how do we treat uh, prostate cancer? So... <clears throat> The best way to treat prostate cancer is number one is risk stratification. So once I have got a prostate cancer risk stratified as an intermediate or a high risk, and I say that, I, I, I judge that this patient requires treatment, then I need to stage the disease. I will do what is known as a PSMA PET CT, which is specific for prostate cancer where uh, it picks up all the prostate cancer cells in the body. Or I do a simple bone scan because the most common area where the prostate cancer spreads is into the bones. So I do a staging investigation and in staging, I am confirmed that this particular prostate cancer is confined to the prostate and not spread anywhere. Then I will, do, I will go ahead with what are called as local therapies. The best way to operate the prostate gland is by robotic surgery. If I do a robotic surgery, I can spare the neighboring vital structures and, and, and the side effects of uh, prostatectomy like erectile dysfunction, all these won't happen if I do a robotic prostatectomy. So this happens, I can do it only when it is operable. That means it should not have invaded the neighboring structures. If it has invaded neighboring structures like rectum or pelvic wall, and I wouldn't be able to operate it even by robotic procedures. So if I can pick up a high-risk prostate cancer or an intermediate-risk prostate cancer, where uh, it's small and it's operable, the best way to do it is by robotic surgery, robotic radical prostatectomy. And this will cure a majority of patients. If I can pick up early, before it has spread, and before it has involved the neighboring structures. If I have the intermediate group where uh, it has not spread anywhere, but it is infiltrating the local areas, it is going into the rectum, it is invading the seminal vesicle, or it is going to the pelvic wall, then the best way for me is to reduce the size of it. How do I reduce the size of a prostate gland? Chemotherapy is not the way to go. So it is not a rapidly multiplying tumor. It is hormone-mediated. So I reduce the testosterone levels by injections. Once the testosterone levels in the body comes down, the prostate cancer, which was growing, which was testosterone mediated, stops growing and it shows regressing. So to be frank, uh, just reducing the testosterone levels gets down, gets down the huge prostate to a very small size in a very short time. In, one, in four to six weeks time, you can see the magical response where just by an injection of reducing the testosterone levels in blood, a huge prostate just comes down in its size. So, uh, the, so that is the beauty of prostate cancer. And that's why we say prostate cancer is a good cancer because all its growth is hormone driven. It is testosterone driven. So if I want to reduce the size of it, I can just reduce the levels of testosterone in the body with the help of injections. 
So the prostate just regresses. So once it regresses, what we call as the new adjuvant hormonal therapy, I will give, we can give what is known as radiotherapy to the prostate, what we call as radical radiotherapy to prostate. And we have good techniques, what we call as IMRT or IGRT, especially we use IMRT, which is intensity modulated radiotherapy to the prostate, where we give radiation only to the prostate, sparing the neighboring structures, sparing the rectum, sparing the uh, bladder. However, there, there will be some side effects, uh, even though we spare, but significant reduction in side effects if I use these novel, sophisticated techniques of radiotherapy, what we call as IMRT. So having said that, so we have seen a scenario where it was totally low risk, where the disease was not multiplying and we observed the patient and we saw a uh, middle uh, where uh, the patient required treatment. It did not spread more. It was small. I could take away with surgery with what is called as radical prostatectomy. And then we saw a little more advanced where it is going into the neighboring structures where I gave a new adjuvant hormonal therapy, reduced the testosterone levels, uh, reduce the size of the prostate gland, and then I gave IMRT, what is intensity modulated radiotherapy. So what if the prostate cancer has spread to bones, lungs, livers, so how do I deal with it? So in oncology, we usually speak of uh, uh, that stage four cancer is a death sentence. The patient is going to die. There's no point treating this patient. That is the usual uh, thought process even today, even till date, cancer has a lot of stigma that uh, a, a patient with fourth stage cancer will not survive. So this is not exactly true with uh, whatever best methods we have at this point of time. So even though a prostate cancer is spread to the bones or to the lung or liver, it can be treated. It can be controlled for a long period of time. So the, again, the whole basis of treating a prostate cancer that has spread, so usually uh, patients who are elderly, around 65, 66, 70 years of age, they come to you with urinary symptoms and a lot of back pain, and you do uh, a PSMA PET CT or a bone scan, you feel multiple bone mass, the prostate cancer has almost spread everywhere to the body. All the bones are eaten up by cancer. So this is how usually a fourth stage prostate cancer patient presents to us with a PSA of around 150 or 200, a huge high PSA with a lot of disease burden in the bone scan and a large prostate locally. So again, uh, the whole backbone of prostate cancer treatment is androgen deprivation therapy where I have to reduce the levels of testosterone because this prostate cancer is driven by testosterone. So the moment I reduce the testosterone, so how do I reduce it? I can reduce it by simple injections. There are injections to reduce the testosterone levels or there are other ways that is by removing both the testes, what we call as bilateral orchidectomy. If I can remove both the testes, then there is nobody to synthesize testosterone. Uh, then, the, so in reality, if a patient of prostate cancer with a lot of symptoms, urinary difficulty, the, the, the cancer is spread all over the bones in extreme pain. If I do an orchidectomy for the patient, you remove both the testes. Within four hours, the patient will have a magical recovery. He, the bone pains just vanish away. The person who had urinary symptoms starts having normal urination. Such a magical recovery happens if I reduce the testosterone levels either by injections or by bilateral orchidectomy. And that's why prostate cancer is a good cancer because it responds to testosterone deprivation. And that's the beauty of prostate cancer. So the backbone treatment of a metastatic prostate cancer is androgen deprivation therapy or by any means, I must reduce the levels of testosterone. So having said that, if I have prostate cancer, uh, not 100% cells are hormone sensitive. I can say on 90, 95% cells do die if 
I reduce testosterone levels either by arteriectomy or by injections. But there are so five to five to ten percent which are androgen resistant. So that you can handle by giving chemotherapy, because these are fastly multiplying cells. They respond well to what is known as a taxin chemotherapy or a docetaxel chemotherapy. So it is so the 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 present day standard of care is not just reducing testosterone levels. With reducing testosterone levels, I can handle around ninety percent cells. The other five to ten percent will be handled by giving chemotherapy. So that is why the standard treatment of the present day metastatic prostate cancer is chemo hormonal therapy, and not just uh, 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 androgen deprivation. Then uh, we have other novel anti-androgens, what we call as abiraterone. and uh, uh, the other one what we call as enzalutamide so these are the ones that uh, prevent synthesis from extra testicular sites like adrenals so abiraterone prevents synthesis from the adrenal gland and we have enzalutamide which is another anti androgen where uh, uh, it prevents any androgen action over the prostate gland so we have this novel uh agents where uh by using all these uh, uh we can uh, prolong the life of the patient uh, by using this multimodality therapy so it is not just androgen deprivation it's also chemotherapy to handle those cells which are resistant to androgen deprivation and we can add abiraterone sequentially uh, where it reduces adrenal androgen synthesis and we can have enzalutamide sequentially where it prevents the direct action of the prostate so if you can sequence the treatment properly by using adt as a backbone and using chemotherapy anti androgen or preventing androgen synthesis at the level of uh, adrenals we can have a reasonably good survival even in a metastatic patient with a preserved quality of life so earlier i mentioned regarding the family history of uh, prostate cancer where uh, around 5 to 10% of patients in different populations can have a genetic history of prostate cancer so even though if there is no genetic history what we usually do is we do what is known as a somatic braca mutation testing on the biopsy blocks if there is a braca mutation present so braca mutation means the dna repair mechanism in the cancer is not there so i will use this uh, 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 inefficiency of the cancer cell and we have drugs like olaparib which uh, simple tablets which can have uh, which can add more life to the patient so with this uh, 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 we can have a understanding of uh, how we can treat prostate cancer so these metastatic prostate cancer patients they are initially responsive to androgen deprivation but as the time goes on uh, in a matter of one and a half to two years or two and a half years they become what is known as castrate resistant what we call as crpc but they are not testosterone resistant uh, uh, so we can use other novel anti androgens so with this uh, 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 we also give what is known as bone strengthening injections uh, to preserve the density of the bone and also we can give some palliative radiotherapy if there is uh, any pain so in addition to this we have other treatments like uh, uh, we give a radium therapy or a samarium therapy which is again their radioactive therapies which we give in prostate cancer mainly for symptomatic benefit and uh, marginal uh, survival benefit is also there so to uh, summarize uh, metastatic prostate cancer metastatic prostate cancer is not a death statement because these cancer cells are sensitive to testosterone deprivation even if it is stage 4 if i can bring the testosterone levels to below the normal range these cells will show a magical response with an excellent quality of life and with this i must also add some chemotherapy to handle the androgen resistant cells and sequentially we can add novel anti androgens like enzalutamide and abiraterone and if there is a braca mutation present we can add olaparib and uh, further on uh, if there are multiple bone diseases there we can add some radium or samarium therapy as well 
So if we can sequence these agents uh, properly with judiciously uh, using them whenever required and monitoring PSA and also uh, symptomatic and radiological monitoring, we can add uh, extra life to the patient. Not only we can add life to the patient, uh, but also we can have an excellent quality of life uh, uh, to the patient. So, uh, so from this, we can have a brief summary that uh, 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 prostate cancer or prostate is basically testosterone-driven proliferation. Uh, whenever a patient has lower urinary symptoms, we must suspect the existence of prostate cancer. The best way to detect this is by uh, uh, using a DRE, by digital rectal examination, the PSA examination, and uh, a multi-parametric MRI when required and a biopsy will confirm and we can stage this by using a PSMA PET CT or a bone scan. So if it is very low risk, very small prostate, no symptoms, and a patient has a low PSA, then we can as well observe and no need of treating him. If it's a, a risk where he needs treatment, and if it's operable, we can do what is known as robotic radical prostatectomy. And then <clears throat> uh, if it's an intermediate risk, uh, then uh, uh, we can uh, give radiotherapy, neoadjuvant, hormonal therapy, and radiotherapy, and the moment it is metastatic. As I said, uh, we need to give what is known as testosterone deprivation therapy with chemo-hormonal therapy, and then sequentially use novel antiandrogens. Use bone-modifying agents, and we can use radium or samarium therapy in further lines. And uh, if there is a BRCA mutation positive, we can use olaparib. So with all these uh, uh, research in place, from bringing signs from bench to bedside, we can cure a significant number of prostate cancer patients. And even if it is metastatic, we can control these prostate cancer patients for a longer period of time. So I would thank uh, uh, Dr. Reddy's for providing the opportunity to speak on prostate cancer. And with this, I would conclude my talk. Thank you.